welcome to Your Family Dog, a podcast dedicated to helping families love living with dogs. Here are your hosts, Julie Fudge-Smith and Colleen Pilar. Hello, and welcome to Your Family Dog. I'm Julie Fudge-Smith, and I'm here with Colleen Pilar, and we love to talk about dogs. And we've been doing this now for several months, and looking at our statistics, we were very excited to see that we had listeners in places we never dreamed we had listeners. Some of those include Portugal, uh, New Zealand, I can't read my own writing here, uh, Zaire, India, Germany, Brazil, Portugal, I think I mentioned that already, and, yes. um, inclu- and Australia, and Canada, and we have hit all the continents, Colleen, except for Antarctica. And I know, and I want to go all of those places. I've only been on your list there to Canada. That's, that's my big adventure on that list of places you just listed. So I have to start scheduling my trip that's to Zaire right. in Burma and everywhere else. So we love that. We, we're super excited that people all over are listening to Your Family Dog. And we would really like some more engagement. We get some emails from listeners, and we love getting we those. We'd also love to get voicemails or voice memos that you can record on your phone and email to us. So if you have any thoughts that you're willing to share or questions you want to ask and you'd like us to ramble on about for half an hour, because that's what we do, we would love to receive them. Our phone number in the U.S. is 614-349-1661, and our email is feedback at yourfamilydogpodcast.com. We're so glad you're listening. So now I suppose we should get back to our topic of the day, which was obesity. And Julie came up with a really scary statistic that I had not heard before. Yes, I was doing some research. And according to a study by the Waltham Center for Pet Nutrition, obesity can reduce the length of a dog's lifespan by up to 10 months. Now, they may not seem like a lot, but what's interesting is is if you take a look at that, is what's an average lifespan for a dog. Now, some of the statistics we found was that a dog over 90 pounds will only live approximately, on an average, 8 years, less than 20 pounds, approximately 11 years, and our mid- to large-range dogs, also about 11 years. So how much is 10 months out of 11 years? Well, it turns out to be 7.6% of your dog's life. If you look at that for an average human who lives 78.8 years, that works out to be six years you would have lost off that life of a human being. So 10 months is a very long time in a dog's life, and certainly one that can be prevented by keeping your dog at an optimum weight. Yes, and looking at some of those statistics and averages was a little bit shocking to me, too. The 10 months thing was shocking, but even just to see, like, if we take all the averages, that 11 is basically our average lifespan for for most of our family dogs, that, I have to admit, is shockingly short. It is. Because when I... When I think, you know, like, oh, yeah, dogs, they, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17. <laughs> Maybe that's a little on the optimistic side. <laughs> but um, but that is something that we all need to be aware of because we so love having our dogs in our lives that, that to lose them 10 months early for something that we could easily control is something we want to be really aware of. Correct. So why is it that you, um, you think dogs trend towards it? There was another statistic I found. Where is it? More than 45% of family dogs, according to the Pet Obesity Prevention, by the Association for Pet Obesity Prevention, more than 45% of dogs and 58% of cats can be classified as overweight or obese. A gain of even a pound or two of additional fat on some dogs and cats can place significant stress on the body Mm -hmm. as well as reduce weight. So, So what are some of the conditions that can occur as a result of excess weight? Um, exercise intolerance and decreased stamina, Mm -hmm. respiratory compromise or breathing difficultly, heat intolerance, high blood pressure, diabetes or insulin resistance, liver disease or dysfunction, osteoarthritis, increased surgical anesthetic risk, lowered immune system function, 
and increased risk of developing malignant tumors or cancer. Sound familiar? Those are the same risks I think that humans face. Right. They, they are in uh, classified as, as and obese. And some of them become a self-fulfilling prophecy. That yes. if you're overweight, it's harder to exercise. And if it's harder to exercise, you're more likely to be overweight. And same thing with the heart disease and the respiratory issues. If you're overweight, it's harder to breathe when you exercise. <laughs> oh, wait, if it's hard to breathe when you exercise, it's easier to be overweight and have this sort of cycle where we get ourselves into a downward spiral. And that can be a really, a really challenging thing. And it's scary to think that so many of our dogs and cats are overweight. But it guess is. what? Our population is overweight too. And I have to say when I'm talking to clients, I'm always a little bit uncomfortable broaching the subject of, by the way, your dog is overweight because guess what? I am too. Uh, Julie, for those of you who need to know, Julie's super fit yoga, <laughs> no, skinny. No. But um, I tend to a little bit curvier. Um, so I have this awkward discussion in which I say, I think we need to talk about your dog's weight. And I recognize that, it's, that I'm sort of do, saying do as I say and not as I do to a certain extent. But your dog isn't the one making the choices Correct. about what your dog is consuming and whether that's good healthy food and whether they're getting enough exercise and whether they're getting enough enrichment and stimulation and all of those things. Your dog can't make these choices. So when I leave the appointment and I eat a Snickers bar, that's my poor choice <laughs> as opposed to um, my dog who may or may have weight issues. That's not necessarily his, you know, control under his control. Right. And I would also say, too, that, that I think that obesity happens in dogs for the same reason that it happens in people, as we've discussed. Lack of exercise, mm-hmm. too much food compared to your exercise, mm-hmm. and poor quality food. And I think that is one that people don't think about nearly as often as, yeah, I need to get out there and exercise more, and yeah, I probably shouldn't eat that Sunday. But it's not necessarily the Sunday. It's the Sunday and the cookies I had the day before, and right. the you know the candy bar I had the other day. And so it's it's consistently poor nutrition leads to obesity and other health problems as well. So and um, for, for our family dogs, most of them are being fed some sort of commercially prepared diet, which means that they get scraps or whatever, but their basic meal is pretty much the same every day. So if it's Correct. not a good high quality meal, we're taking one day's poor choice and, and putting the next day's poor choice on top of it. Whereas if you right. go to McDonald's and have that once in a while, it's fine because you're not having it every day. But if you were having that every day, some of these some of these ramifications add up faster. Right. In fact, I think there was a guy who did a, a, a it was a book and at least a a, a, a movie called Super, Super Size, Size Me, Me. Yep. where he ate all of his meals. And by the end of the month, where he ate every meal at McDonald's, the guy was just in horrible shape. He had gained a lot of weight and his blood pressure had soared and his skin quality was poor and all kinds of things. So I think quality of food is something that um, can really make a huge difference. And I know for a lot of people, one of the issues with feeding a higher quality food is, unfortunately, it is more expensive. Mm-hmm. But on the it other is. hand, you tend to feed less of it because it's denser nutrition. And I always yes. tell people, one of the things that, that I, when I get a dog especially if I get a puppy, I want to try to build the best dog possible from the ground up. And so I'm willing to compromise a, a little bit and give him really good quality food and make sure that he has all the things he needs because I'm thinking in the long run, I'm going to be spending a lot less on vet bills if I had built a healthy dog from the ground up. So yes, those right. higher premium foods That's- are more expensive. That's a great way to think of it. When I have clients who are a little bit older, uh, meaning over 30, and probably over 35. (laughs) You mean like me? (laughs) If they remember the old Total commercials. The younger people don't know these at all. But there's a cereal called Total, and their advertising campaign used to be, how many bowls of this kind of cereal does it take to equal the nutrition in one bowl Bowl of of Total? And they would, they would compare, you know, it would take you eight bowls 
bowls of cornflakes to equal the nutrition in one bowl of total or whatever it was. And they would figure this out. And that's what I tell people about the high quality foods. Right. So sometimes what we're looking at is, is it going to take you significantly more volume of food to equal the nutrition that your dog needs in a lower quality food? And you might be feeding significantly less in the higher quality food. But when you look at the price per pound, you get sticker shock because you're like, per pound, oh my gosh, I'm paying two or three or times as much that um, that's going to break the bank. But it's not going to break the bank because A, you'll be feeding a little bit less and B, you're building a healthier dog, hopefully that we're getting. And there are definitely behavior differences in dogs who are on high quality diets versus low quality diets. Absolutely. I can walk in a room and go, okay, wow. We Absolutely. Might need to think about that. Um, in fact, I wrote an article called food, glorious food. We'll put a link to that blog. And, um, the whole dog journal does a yearly review of dog foods that I highly recommend anything they recommend. I recommend, but there's another company called review.com and they did a review of dog food and their criteria was quite extensive and they interviewed a wide variety of people. And one of the things that they found was with poor food that, and I quote, physical problems are only half of it. There was unanimous consensus among trainers and behaviorists we talked to that poor diet causes mental health issues in dogs, including poor temperament and lack of focus. Mark Abraham elaborates, certain popular pet food brands on the market contain extra colorings, additives, and e-numbers that, in my opinion, can affect behavior, leading to hyperactivity and difficulty with training. And I think Mm -hmm. that's something that you and I have both truly experienced. And... So I think that there are a whole lot of reasons. So if your dog is hyperactive and unable to focus and feels like it looks like a toddler on sugar, well, you know, very well could be he is like a toddler on sugar because if there's yes. a, certain ingredients will cause dogs to behave in that way. And so I think that when you, you look at foods, you need to think about what am I trying to do? Am I just trying to have my dog survive or do I really want him to thrive? And I think you right. and I both really want dogs to thrive. And so if you're feeding, you know, six cups of kibbles and bits, but you only have to feed three cups of origin and your dog's getting more dense, compact, appropriate nutrition, Mm -hmm. you might find that it's really worth that extra money because it's going to help your dog on so many different levels. Yes. And I think... We were talking a little bit in a previous episode about the word companion being one that you share food with. Right. Companion. (laughs) And I think food is a way we show love. Mm -hmm. And so for many, for many families, their dog is being loved by being overfed. And if Mm -hmm. we can find ways to show love that are either lower calorie or you know, same amount of calorie, more work, then that can balance it out because it's, it's not a case of the, that people don't care about their dogs. So like my dog is overweight and I don't care. It's my dog is overweight because I adore him. Yes. That's usually, (laughs) usually so, um, that recognizing that piece when we look at, you know, well, what can we do to make this more fun? How can we help your dog to the the interactive intelligence toys are such a good way Absolutely. of helping a dog really work for meals and and figure things out and enjoy the the hunt of it and and dogs really love that they love the the puzzle aspect of it of right. like, let me let me work for this and Zazie talked about that Zazie Todd talked about that mm-hmm. in our podcast with her that actually studies in in uh, I can't remember where it was it was no Bristol was the tug study doesn't matter but there are actual studies that show that dogs prefer to work for the food they they prefer the puzzling kind of thing mm-hmm. so if you want to spoil your dog I've had people tell me I can't spoil my kids I just want to spoil my dog well. <laughs> I get that. I understand that completely. But there are other ways in which you can spoil him. I um, mm-hmm. was talking to a, a friend, and she was saying that her dog is, is overweight. And I she made and so I made some suggestions for her. And she said, but he doesn't seem to be all that interested in eating. The food stays in the bowl, and he eats it. And then my husband feels bad that he's not eating, so he gives him scraps from the table. Mm-hmm. And so she made three changes, and they were pretty easy changes. One, she switched to a high-quality food. Mm -hmm. Two, she took away the bowl. And all of the food, she got both wet and dry food of this high-quality food. And she put layers in a Kong. 
of dry food and wet food. And so the dog is, the food is measured out. He gets three Kongs a day and Mm -hmm. he gets, and he works for his food and he loves it. He loves the food. He loves the puzzle. He's become more engaged with them. He's become more animated with them. Her husband does. And she also told him, you can't feed him any more scraps because Mm -hmm. we're giving him all these toys. So I think he slips him a little something, but not nearly as much because he doesn't feel as sorry for him because he's having so much more fun eating. And in something like two or three weeks, probably probably three or four weeks, the dog lost two pounds, which we figured out was about 5% of his body weight, which was really good. And now he's feeling better and he's playing more. And the whole thing is starting to cycle in a positive direction. So I thought those are three simple things you can do. Those are really simple things you can do. And 5% of your body weight doesn't sound like that much, or 2 pounds doesn't sound like that much. But 5% is where, where they say for people, too, that you're going right. to start feeling different and and looking different, but mostly feeling different. You're going to feel healthier if you lose 5% of your body weight. So it's an interesting piece. One other piece that comes into play with obesity is we use food and training. And lots of people will say, Mm -hmm. well, if my dog's already overweight, then I can't use food and training because that's just going to make him fatter. You know, I don't want a fat dog. And um, that's not true. That again, if we're having the dog work for food and making it a part of their life and doing that, Pam Nashman, the owner of All About Dogs, adopted a Rottweiler years ago who was at least 20 pounds overweight and had a pretty significant reactivity issue. So Pam really had to work with this dog to retrain some of her behavior, which meant she was using food all the time. She was training this dog all the time. And that 20 pounds melted off the dog and she looked great and her she behaved better and everything was better, but she was being fed a lot because she was working this way, but she was being fed deliberately high quality food for specific portions at specific times for specific reasons. And so using food and training did not affect, you know, we didn't have using food for training equals fat dog, which is such a common uh, right. concern. Right. And what I will tell people is, is it when you are working at home and training your dog, use his food. You know, Mm -hmm. if you need to go into a more distracting environment where the food is not going to be enough to bring the dog away Mm -hmm. from the distraction, sure, add in some treats. But you can do some pretty good treats that are not that high calorie, like boiled chicken Mm -hmm. is, is a great one, or boiled hamburger, or something along that line. And then what you do is you subsequently reduce the amount of food you give them at home in their bowl so that you can find some balances here. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, and, and if you think and about looking, even at, at home, if you're, if you're not using food at home and you're using some other treat, the treat I use at home, if I'm not using food is Cheerios hmm. because they have very low calorie and there's nothing too exciting about them. But if you were to compare them against a dog treat, a dog treat is likely to be much higher in calorie and much higher in higher in junk you know, all sorts of additives and preservatives and all sorts of other things. So just using your standard kibble at home is is genius mode. It's just very, very helpful. But if you just want to keep something nearby, it's like, yeah, you get a special treat at my house. It's Cheerios. Woo! And it's very exciting because he doesn't know that there are other options at home. (laughs) He loves his Cheerio game. Oh, that's a great idea. The other thing is, is I also tell my owners, is if you're going to be careful about the food, you kind of need to be careful about the treats, too. Oh, yeah. So um, start reading labels for treats. Mm-hmm. I know that my bookkeeper, for the first <laughs> two years, it's like, Julie, do you understand how much you spend? Like, yes, I do. I understand exactly how much I spend on treats um, because I, I buy good quality treats because if I'm going to be working with a client's dog, I don't want to feed them something that, that I wouldn't give my own dog. And right. there are certain ones out there, like right now, the dog's personal favorite is lamb lung. Now, there's mm-hmm. just not a lot of calories in lamb lung because there's a lot of air. Um, yeah. But there's something about these lamb lung fillets that just send them over the top. So I, I don't mind, and you can buy them, by the way, in bulk so that mm-hmm. you can get <laughs> people like lamb lung. And I'm like, yes, and it's gluten-free, which is always amazing to me that you put... <laughs> think that just in lung- case I wanted to snack on some. <laughs> That's right. But anyway, so there are treats out there. But if you are going to use industrial treats, make sure that you are careful about the ones that you buy so that the fat content and the, the junk yes. in them is not is uh, 
like your dog. If you're going to be careful with your dog food, be careful about your treats as well. Yeah. And it's easy to lose track of your dog's weight, just like it is your yes. own weight. Yes. Uh, because it changes gradually. It's a little bit here and there. I actually had an experience about six months ago where I took my dog in for his six month visit and it turned out he had dropped weight and I hadn't realized. And he's a he's a fluffy dog. He's got an undercoat and everything and he looked the same to me. But he had dropped a Two, two and a half pounds. And the big difference was I was walking more. So he and I were going walking more, which he loved and I loved. And it was good for me. I had also probably dropped two pounds. <laughs> um, but I hadn't noticed that he was losing weight. So my vet taught me this, this method for identifying whether you think your dog is Goldilocks style, too thin, too fat, or just right. And I'm going to attempt to describe it with words, but I have to tell you, I need a visual for this one. So I will actually record a short video that explains this too. So if you want to see it, just check out the show notes. But here's my best attempt with words. So look at your, let's, let's do it right-handed so I can make sure I'm being consistent. So if we put your right hand out in front of you, just sort of loose on the table, and you run your fingers across the back of your hand, like the back of the palm, just below the knuckles, that's kind of how your dog's ribs should feel. Like you can identify the bones in there, but you're not feeling every distinct ridge within there. Then take your hand and make a fist. And if you run your fingers across the knuckles, now they're really jutting out. The knuckles themselves across the top are jutting out, and that is too thin. So we would be thinking of that like if you ran your fingers down your dog's rib cage and you could feel very distinctly between each one, too thin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's where my poor little Edzo was under all his fluff after our increased walking. So now we take your hand and flip it over so you have the back of your hand lying on the table, and you're going to run your fingers across that same knuckle area, like at the base of your fingers, This is what too fat feels like. So there's like too much muscle and tissue and fat here for you to really distinctly feel each of these bones. So if your dog's ribs feel like that, we're probably a little overweight. And then if you take your hand and feel along the pad of your um, your thumb, the thumb area. Yeah. So I'm like saying the pad of your thumb, but it's actually the, the, the bone in your palm itself. That would be like obesity, like if that much pressure and you're trying to hunt around to find the bone in there. So looking at those areas, if we use our palms and feel against the dog's rib cage and compare how do my dog's ribs feel compared to my hand, it kind of gives you a, a little rule of thumb that can be helpful. And it can help people to identify uh, my husband's phrase is, is the dog slim, trim, and racy or not? You know, like slim, trim, right. and racy, sure, that's great. Or are we looking at maybe too skinny or a little overweight. I so. think that's a great way to look at it. And you did a lovely job of describing it, Colleen. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the other thing I wanted to mention, too, is that if you do come to the conclusion that your dog is overweight or obese and that you need to do something about it, remember that he didn't get overweight overnight. Mm-hmm. You cannot, there's such a thing as losing weight too fast. Yes. So you want to talk to your vet Find out how much weight he thinks your dog needs to lose and come up with a plan for how we're going to lose that weight. What Mm -hmm. kind of food are we going to switch to if you need to switch food? And what's the proportion he needs to get and stick to it? The Mm -hmm. other thing is, is add your exercise in proportionally. Don't suddenly decide, okay, you are just one little fluffy bag of stuff you know you're just a little my little pudgy guy let's go for a run no you want to increase his exercise in the same way as you're going to decrease his food you want to slim him down in a reasonable way because what we don't want to do is is cause the poor little dog a heart attack by suddenly making him walk two miles when he can't even mm-hmm. really walk around the block without losing his breath so right. when you decide or if you decide that this is something that needs to be addressed Talk to your vet and get a plan in place for a reasonable reduction mm-hmm. in weight and a reasonable increase in exercise. The other thing you might do, too, is if your dog is older than five or six, 
make sure some blood work is done on your dog because there can be other reasons why dogs are either gaining or losing weight. There yes. can be thyroid issues. There can be other issues. And you certainly want to make sure that his blood panel is okay, that he's not, arth- that um, if he's got arthritis, sometimes dogs don't let us know that they're in pain, that their mm-hmm. hips or their knees are arthritic. So if you're going to start a walking regime, you don't want to paralyze him with pain. So you might want to think about, do we need some pain meds and or some joint relief or something. So especially if your dog is a little bit older, I'd say at least five or older, make sure you have a good thorough physical, including blood work, to make sure that there aren't any other underlying problems that may be contributing to his either weight loss or weight gain. Yes, because we want to keep those 10 months. We want you to have every wonderful moment with that dog and not shorten their lives by 10 months. That's by right. By being overweight. That's right. So I think that pretty much covers obesity. And thank you, Colleen, for being so kind. I'm not nearly as felt as I used to be, but, you know, <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. So um, She is. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for listening to us once again, all our good friends in Sweden, which is one place that I forgot to mention, and, and the UK, and all those other places. Keep listening, and let us know your thoughts. And Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. We would love to hear from you, and if you really like us, in, and you're downloading us regularly, make sure you leave us a review so that other people in Zaire and Portugal and Sweden may know where Absolutely. to find us. That would be great. It really does make a difference. Leaving reviews makes a big difference for the search engines for people to find Abs- other podcasts that they like. And I listen to a bunch of different podcasts and I do know that some of them I found based on reviews. So we would very much appreciate any reviews anyone could leave. All right. Well, thank you. And I'll see you next week, Colleen. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Your Family Dog. Got questions? Interesting ideas? Colleen and Julie would love to hear them. Call 614-349-1661 or visit www.yourfamilydogpodcast.com to share your thoughts.